Good morning, my friends. I'm Pastor Stephen Brooks. Welcome today to Morning Glory, our midweek Bible study. And I'm so glad that you're here today. Why don't you take your Bible and meet me in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Today, let's talk about growing in the anointing. Praise God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we jump into your word, we ask that your Holy Spirit would illuminate the scriptures that we can walk in the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Thank you, Father God, for giving us living manna today, living bread. We thank you that your word is alive to us. In Jesus' name we pray, and we all agree and say, Amen. Praise God. Now, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, and I want to make this declaration that God has a plan for your Christian maturity. Praise God. He wants you to reach the high levels that he has destined for you to not only live in, but to experience and enjoy. And so God wants to bring us to a point where Christ is seen in us through our character, our actions, our words, and so forth. So this is God's design, heaven's design for you and I to come into a place of maturity that the scriptures actually identify as being a place of perfection in the sense that is representing the word or the concept of the mature believer. And we see this in Ephesians chapter four, verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God to a perfect man, or that word perfect means mature to a mature fully formed man to the measure of the stature of what? Of the fullness of Christ. So that's what God is bringing us into is fullness. Fullness in what? Fullness in Christ. Praise God. And the anointing is the provision that God has made for you and I to come into that fullness. And that's why we need to talk about growing in the anointing. Praise God. So you and I have the ability to grow in the anointing of the Holy, excuse me, the Holy Spirit. Let's take an example for a moment. Let's say that uh, one of you watching me is a businessman or businesswoman. And I know that there's quite a few of you that are in those categories. So you're a businessman or a businesswoman. Let's say you're in sales with your business, but you're, you're not making the sales that you want. Maybe you, you're making less than you, what, uh, than what you made previously. And you're not up to quota and you're not happy with your, uh, Uh, with what's actually taking place. So let's look at it from this perspective. So your business sales are not going that good. What about Jesus? What if he were in business, the same business as you, and he's a salesman? Do you think that his business would flounder? Oh, no, Pastor Stephen, not Jesus. He's the son of God. He would succeed in everything that he's, that he touches. Same with you. Whatever it is that you're called to do, you're supposed to succeed in. And it's the anointing that empowers you to reach the top and come into fullness of the character and the nature of Christ, and also to come in the fullness in the assignment, the career field that God has positioned you in. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. So every believer needs to be anointed. And I, I really do believe that the anointing is the remedy for frustration. Mm -mm. So you can make that decision to either be anointed or to be frustrated because trust me, when the anointing comes, there's power in that. And that power gives you movement. It's upward movement. Praise God. So it is very critical that we not only talk about the anointing, but that we experience it. And because it's in increments, it's in measures that you also be increasing in it so that you reach the destination that God 
has for you. Praise the Lord. Yes, the anointing is in measures. And you know, the truth is, is that we're all differently anointed. We're all in different phases of our lives. We are uh, all in different uh, measures of that anointing based upon our reactions to it. And the degree to which an individual is anointed, this is very important, please listen. The degree to which an individual is anointed is not determined by God, but it's determined by the individual because the anointing can be increased. Praise God. Let's go over to John chapter three and uh, take a look just for a moment of where you're headed towards John chapter three, verse 34, verse 34, praise God for he, that would be the father whom God, excuse me, that would be Jesus for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the spirit by measure. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. So my friends, that's where you're headed. You're headed towards greater dimensions of the Holy Spirit operating in your life and your understanding of the will of God and the ways of God and coming into a flow with that, a very, very deep flow. So we are left with the question, how can we grow from measure to measure? See, God does not give the spirit by measure concerning the working of the Lord Jesus, praise God. And so we can come into this place where there's a vast expanse, but you build up into that by measure, by measure, praise God. And then you can get over into a place where there is There's depth beyond comprehension, praise God, but that is the realm God wants to get us into. And I believe one of the greatest examples of this is found in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 47. Now, I received a question at my email today, which is contact at stephenbrooks.org. By the way, I'm sure you understand that I, I can't answer every question that comes in, but I do uh, take an interest in them. And if I can't answer it in, you know, an email reply, I'll try to at least uh, touch that area in one of my sermons. By the way, if you do have questions, if you'll just pray in the Spirit, um, when I teach, the Holy Spirit helps me to pick up on that. He empowers me to pick up on these questions that many of you have out there. And so oftentimes I take these, I would call them prophetic rabbit trails. I begin to discuss or talk about certain questions that some of you are actually pondering and the Holy Spirit helps me to answer those. And that is of course, through a prophetic anointing, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. But I had a question about the millennium. What is the role of the believer during the millennium? Well, I have to admit that if you want to study that subject, here's your chapter right here and uh, read the chap the chapter, uh, the 40th chapter, you know, 40, 41 and 44, 46, all the way through 48. And you're really be getting into a good understanding of what the millennial reign is going to look like. And, uh, you know, even the layout of the tribes of Israel during the 1000 year reign of Christ are also, uh, mentioned. Many people have a lot of questions. What will be the positioning of the tribes? All of that is explained as well as some astounding things that are revealed in the book of Ezekiel concerning the future temple. Wow. Very, very fascinating. Now, of course, when you read that, no, God's not taking people back under Judaism, but he is taking them through certain acts that help them to understand what he actually accomplished at Calvary. Woo, praise the Lord. So it's very, very exciting. And there are those in this earthly life who meet the qualifications laid out in scripture for overcomers. And if you're an overcomer, then there will be ruling and reigning with Christ, uh, certain positions that are given out 
in the millennium reign. But you can't be somebody as a child of God who, uh, you know, you don't rise up. You don't become the person that God wants you to be. You just sit back and let all the others carry the weight. No, but when you begin to overcome, then you actually begin to position yourself for future rewards and assignments from the Lord. Praise God. But of course, that's a different subject. Today, we're talking about the anointing and how it can be increased. So we're now in Ezekiel chapter 47, and let's take a look at actually where the anointing begins. Let's start in verse 1. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. Now, I know some theologians read this and say, well, yes, this is the water that will flow down uh, towards the south, and it will revitalize the Dead Sea and turn it into a tropical paradise. Praise God. That's all good. Yes, there will be uh, teeming amounts of fish, uh, and the Dead Sea will no longer be dead. It will have uh, fish just like you have out in the uh, Mediterranean. But my friends, you have to understand this is not just like uh, uh, water that's, uh, you know, good, healthy, fresh water from an underground aquifer. This is a living type of water that uh, has a supernatural element to it, even where the fruit trees that are growing on the bank of the river are producing fruit, not every season, but every single month. So this is not your normal drinking water, praise God. All right, so we need to understand that the water is speaking here of the initial experience of salvation or what we could call the new birth experience, or we could also call it being born again. Praise God. And this is where it all begins, the anointing coming on the inside. Praise the Lord. But when this happens, this, this is like standing on the seashore. You're just beginning the journey, praise God. It's not the end, it's only the beginning, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go to John chapter 7, just for a moment. We're coming right back. But John chapter 7 and verse 38, Jesus said, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Mm -mm. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, we know that Jesus has now been glorified. He has gone up to heaven. He is seated right now at the right hand of the Heavenly Father, and the Holy Spirit has been given. He was, he was released on the day of Pentecost. Woo, praise God. Amen. So any time someone is born again and receives Christ into their heart, the Holy Spirit comes in. Praise God. And there is the indwelling presence of God. There is the anointing within. But my friends, there's also the tremendous potential to develop the anointing upon. But you have to be born again. Why? Because God does not anoint vessels or individuals that are spiritually dead. You have to be alive. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. The anointing begins at the new birth. Now, having understood that, let's go back. And I know that's easy for you to grasp. Let's go back to the book of Ezekiel again, chapter 47. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord. Ezekiel 47, and let's start at the first level or the first measure of the anointing. Praise the Lord. Chapter 47, verse 3, and when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The water came up to my ankles. Ooh, praise God. Reach down right now, right where you're at, and touch 
your ankles. Hallelujah. And say, this is good. This is good that I'm getting wet, but there's more. Praise God. See, salvation is like, I just got saved and I'm standing on the beach. I'm standing on the seashore. I'm ready to go. But then you're ready for an increase of the anointing. You're ready for what we see as the first level, which is the ankle level. What is the ankle level? It is the initial experience of receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that there are some wonderful ministers out there who do not speak in tongues, who do not believe uh, in what we as spirit-filled believers know as the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But let me tell you that it makes all of the difference in the world concerning the measure of the anointing that you walk in. And let me share a little bit here from personal experience. I was raised in a denomination that taught there is no baptism in the Holy Spirit. That was only for the first century believers, uh, such as Acts chapter 2, things like that. I was taught in this denomination there are no modern day miracles. And I, they would explain it by saying the Bible is a complete book and that's all you need. Well, in a sense, I can understand that, yes, all you need is God's Word, and if that's all we had, that's enough for me. But the Word is validated through signs, wonders, and miracles. So, of course, they were missing out on, on a lot of things. They even taught that it was a sin. The denomination that I was raised in taught that it was a sin that have a, to have musical instruments in the church. And they actually, I mean, I heard it from the pulpit that if you have a piano in the church, that's a sin. You can go to hell for that. If you have a guitar in the church. And so this was a very strict, you could rightfully call it legalistic denomination. But yet again, it was through that denomination that I heard the gospel preached and I got saved. Hallelujah. So I, I at least <laughs> I'm standing on the seashore and when I was, you know, 18 years old, I went off to college. I went to a Christian university. This university, uh, in some ways, the city where it was located at, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, would be considered maybe the headquarters of this denomination. And off I went because, you know, I was raised in this church stream. And so, you know, this is where you go. I, I actually had a full scholarship uh, in track at a different university that oddly enough became the competitive, one of the competitors in the conference that we belong to. So here I was, uh, going to a, a Christian university and they had this university, they had signed up a lot of track stars that were from out of the country. They were really good. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, when you had Carl Lewis, uh, one of America's greatest sprinters, and they had, you know, the four by 100 meter uh, Olympic team. Well, Carl Lewis and the U.S. team won gold. W well, the team that got silver, three quarters of those guys on the relay team, that was the track team that I belonged to. So it was stacked with the Olympians. And because of that, not only was it stacked in the sprints, but also the middle distance events, I didn't qualify there for a scholarship, but the, com the competitor offered me, <laughs> I told my parents, I said, hey, I've got a full ride over here. They said, son, you need to go to the Christian university. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> I actually went to the Christian university and in some ways kind of fell away from God because uh, uh, you can have a lot of it right in name, but it's not, that doesn't mean people living it indeed. Nevertheless, that's a whole different story. We you know we all have our own testimonies of how we discover God and have real encounters with the Lord. But um, you know what? While I was at the Christian university, uh, you know, this, of course, this is the university that, that is affecting the denomination that I belong to because the teachers there are the ones at the top. And uh, then it filters down to all of the churches scattered around America and the various ones scattered around, you know, other parts of the world. So these, these that would be there at the university teaching would be considered the best of the best. But here's what I noticed. While they were all brilliant 
in their minds, and you had Greek scholars, you had Old Testament Hebrew scholars, and you had men that were uh, very, very deep in theology, yet when it, come, it came to preaching or teaching, uh, you know, it's, that, it was good, but it, uh, it didn't grab you. But I did um, form a relationship with one of the professors at the college because I had a great interest in missions. And he was over uh, one of the areas of the mission uh, or missiology departments. And so uh, he would teach those that had an interest in going off to, mi to the mission field. And so he seemed to have something that the others didn't have. And I couldn't figure it out. I remember one time I had a really rough day at, at, at the college. I can't remember even really what happened, but uh, uh, I, I was not happy. I was actually upset about something, and I was going into the chapel, and it was a very large uh, chapel. Everybody that went to the university was required to go to the chapel. And so that's about, you know, about four or 5,000 college kids going into the chapel auditorium. So I, I was going in, and I was upset, and he saw me. He said, Stephen, is everything okay? And I went over to the side where he was at, and I said, uh, no, uh, things aren't okay today. And he just put his hand on me and prayed like a short little prayer that only lasted maybe like five or seven seconds. But when he put his hand on me, it's like something went all through me that felt so warm and good. And I was like, what? I was thinking, I didn't say it, but I was thinking, what in the world is that? Well, it's the anointing. Now, I didn't find this out till later, years later, probably about five years later, when I had transferred to a different university to complete my degree. Never did complete it. Life had a way of uh, uh, throwing some things at me that took me in a totally different direction. But nevertheless, when I was in a different city, uh, I met one of the ministers at this city who was spirit-filled, and uh, he happened to know this this pastor just brought him up in a conversation one day. I said, I know him. And that, that other minister said, oh, yes, he's spirit-filled, speaks in tongues. I said, he does? He said, well, yes, he does. Well, you know, a lot of times when you get out on the mission field, especially when you go to Africa, that's where he had been at, you're going to get you're going to get filled with the Holy Spirit. But it made such a difference in an ability to minister how? With an anointing, not just reciting profound knowledge, not just, uh, and trust me, there were, there were some there that were um, brilliant. I, I had one of the preachers that one of the churches I attended, he stood up and he quoted the entire book of First Corinthians, all from memory. And he didn't miss a single word. Everything was in perfect order. And he just stood there and quoted First Corinthians chapter one and just began to go. It took him about an hour to do it. <laughs> Those were the kind of teachers that were there. So you could see brilliance, but when it came to the anointing, wow, that was a game changer. And that's the thing that eventually caught me. I turned on television and I would see ministers like Rod Parsley and I would see ministers like Dwight Thompson and I would see ministers like R.W. Shambach and I was just like, what, uh, what is this? I so said, I didn't know what the anointing was, but I just knew it was like, that's what I wanted because they had it. And I couldn't even just, uh, I couldn't put it in the words. I can now because it's in the Bible. Again, it's the anointing, but that's what they were walking in because I had never heard preaching like that before. <laughs> I had never heard teaching like that before. And they had it all over them. Praise God. And you know, it's a beautiful thing, but my friends, the anointing is a separator. I mean, it's, it's like, if you have it, it's like honey on you <laughs> and others that see it might not even be able to really accurately describe what it is. They might say, Oh, he's got a charismatic personality. Well, they don't even know what the word charismatic means. They're just trying to somehow identify who or what <laughs> you are in this invisible, you know, thing that makes you so different. But, uh, but of course it begins at salvation, but you have to get off the beach and get out into the water. And so the ankle deep is the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And you could be watching me today and you could be a minister that's been preaching for 10 or 20 years. And you might think, well, my goodness, Pastor Stephen, I've been in ministry for 20 years and I, I haven't even gotten ankle deep. Trust me, the moment you get filled with the Holy Spirit and you recognize that anointing, 
you'll you'll be you'll be having to realize that while you have been able to touch or bless others you can't you can't make that power difference until you get out there in the water which is to get out in the anointing whoo praise god thank you lord jesus so that's a wonderful thing and that's where it begins but even when you get out into the river, out into the water, and you now speak in tongues, that also is not the end. That is the introduction into the spirit-filled walk. And that's what I didn't understand. I got filled with the Holy Spirit at a small Pentecostal church. And we were all young people. Our pastor at that time was 27. And of course, when I'm, you know, I was like a, maybe like a 20. 23 or 24, I thought he was real old because he's 27. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. But, you know, we, when we all were getting filled with the Holy Spirit, it was kind of like a charismatic revival going on uh, amongst us. Uh, we didn't, we didn't realize, hey, this is just like the beginning. We thought, oh, this is it. We've hit the top of the mountain. But, you know, it's not. It's the beginning. It's the ankle deep experience and you must go on. Somebody might say, Pastor Stephen, I, I've been filled with the Spirit. I speak in tongues. Good. That's wonderful. Praise God. Uh, welcome to the water. Glad you're not just standing on the beach looking around. But my friends, there's a lot more of God that He has made Himself available to you, and you need to get out further. You know, so often when you get into the water, maybe it's not comfortable at first. I was just at the Atlantic Ocean with my wife and, uh, uh, you know, uh, children and grandchildren, etc. And we had a very remote area of the beach. I love it. Nothing happier than being able to go to the beach and you can look to the left and there's nobody for half a mile. You look to the right and there's nobody. It's fantastic. Praise God. So we're just out there having fun, uh, gathering seashells. Would you believe that Pastor Kelly on her morning walk on the beach actually found an ultra rare megalodon tooth that had washed up on the shore that morning? And the thing is huge. It's also serrated at both edges. Woo, glory to God. And um, so, but anyhow, when, you know, I would go into the water and, uh, and play around with the kids and stuff like that. And until you get in it, really, you're not quite comfortable because maybe it's, uh, it's not warm enough or might not feel the way you want it to. But once you get out there and start getting really wet and just getting used to it, you actually become comfortable. Woo, praise the Lord. Mm -mm. So what does that mean? It means you need to move to a new measure. Let's find out more about it. Verse 4, again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters. The water came up to my knees. All right, so we have progressed past the ankle stage, and now we're out at the knee level of anointing. This is a very active area of prayer. I think it's fascinating that Scripture describes it here as that knee level because so often prayer is associated with kneeling in prayer or being on your knees in prayer. We had a lady that came by the church, a dear intercessor, a ministry partner. She came and she uh, was just wanting to pray on the property and uh, she came and prayed and uh, my wife would look out the window and there she is still. Uh, hour after hour, she's what? On her knees praying. So this is a deeper level, a deeper walk with God. Thank you, Jesus. This is where you leave behind the low levels of earthly living, and you come into a realm where God begins to move you out of obscurity, and that is primarily because you come into a place of knowing your destiny and your purpose here on earth. And, of course, once you know it, now you're engaging it and you're beginning to step into that. And really what happens is when you find out who you are and, and also who you aren't, you begin to soar. You begin to go up. Your prayer life comes alive. Hallelujah. And you begin to enjoy the water. Thank you, Jesus. And your identity is unveiled. And now you're very excited about life. And you still can have some things that you have to overcome 
that you have to work through because there's more, there's more uh, increase of the measure. Praise God. But I'll, I'll tell you what, you've come a long ways since standing on the seashore. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I had been filled with the Holy Spirit when I was a young man in my 20s, early 20s. And, uh, you know, I was very thankful. And I had a very profound encounter with God when I was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was so, uh, to me, sacred and precious that I didn't really want to stop. So despite just a little bit of sleep at night, I prayed in tongues almost nonstop for, for right at three days straight. <laughs> Because it was all new to me. And I was also, I felt a little bit like an onion because the Holy Spirit was peeling off of me uh, a lot of religiosity. Uh, you know, uh, you can be, if you're raised in church, and particularly if there's been a lot of legalism, uh, there has to be a deconstructing of some things that, uh, you know, it, it, some of it's not so much even bad or wrong as it is, it's just not the clear reflection of the Lord. Again, I thank God for the denomination in which I was raised because of nothing else, at least I heard the gospel and I got saved. I thank God for my parents that took me and my brothers to church so that we could hear the gospel preached. And I will always be grateful for those ministers that I sat under. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But my friends, when I became baptized in the Holy Spirit, I also realized that I had picked up some things of uh, some things that needed to go. I'll just leave it at that. Praise God. And I thought, and I actually had a talk with the Lord one day as I was telling him my thoughts. I, I said, Lord, you know what? If I could just get free from a couple of these things that somehow got attached to my life through, you know, the mess that I've come out of and stuff like that, Lord, if I could just get free, I think that you and I could really do some things together. I think that you could work through me and, uh, some good things could happen. And uh, I just presented that to the Lord. That night, I had a very, very beautiful dream. And it was a dream that was so beautiful, I still remember it today. Now, let me say this. Not only do I remember it because it made such an impression upon me, I remember it because I also wrote it down. Praise God. And some of you need to also learn that, that a short pencil is better than a long memory. Praise the Lord. So yes, I remember it, but it's nice knowing I've got it backed up because I also wrote it out. Praise God. I call it the dream of the purple kite where I was sitting at the table. It was a picnic table and all these pigs were sitting at the, at the table bench, you know, and they're eating, they're eating a bunch of, uh, where they're eating food that pigs eat, which is slop and uh, yucky stuff like that. And I'm sitting at the table and I'm, I'm thinking, God, I, I really don't like this. <laughs> I don't like eating what the world is feeding me. And that was a time in my life where I would go out and watch a, you know, like a, what we would call a rated R movie or something like that. And, uh, you know, I would do that with my other friends of the same age group. And, uh, but I'd gotten filled with the Holy Spirit and I, I didn't want to do that stuff anymore. I knew it grieved the Holy Spirit. So I'm at this table with all this junk, all the table that others, that the other, uh, that these pigs are eating. And I, of course, I don't like to have to sit down with a bunch of pigs uh, and much less eat what they're eating. And, uh, and suddenly I began to rise up from the table. I somehow started going up in the air and I could look down from a high position and I could see the pigs at the table. And then I saw myself, I saw my arms extended. I had been transformed into a purple kite. And uh, it was a, of course purple representing the color of royalty. And I began to understand who I was in the Lord. I even began to understand that even my name, Stephen in the Greek means crowned. And I began to know that God sees me as being in Christ. And I began to really identify with that. And those things that used to hold me, habits, addictions, lifestyle choices that would set me back, they came off of me. Praise God. And I, I began to go up in the things of God. What's going on? What's going on? I'm out there in the deeper waters. I'm out there with my knees. And the things that held me previously before began to fall off. 
Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And really, this is a realm where Proverbs chapter 9, verses 10 and 11 come alive. Let's take a look at that together. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What is the fear of the Lord? Is it to run out of the room afraid when God's presence shows up? No. When you sense the glory, do you panic and pull your hair out and run away in fear? No. Can I tell you what the, what the fear of the Lord is? I know many times we say it's the reverence of God, reverence for the things of God. Let me just break it down even more in layman terminology. The fear of the Lord is to do what God says to do. That's all it is. And if somebody who is a Christian says, I fear the Lord, yet they don't do what God tells them to do, and they actually do the things that God says, don't do, <laughs> then what that is conveying is an absence of the fear of the Lord. So when you walk in the fear of the Lord, that introduces you to the realm, the world of wisdom, God's wisdom world. And what is wisdom? One of the definitions of wisdom is the ability to understand a consequence. Wisdom is the ability to even anticipate a consequence. When you're walking in the fear of the Lord, you just know, hey, if we do those things that aren't right, this is not going to turn out well. Who are we kidding? Are we lying to ourselves thinking that we can do this and practice this and somehow everything's going to be okay? Oh, uh, no, it's not going to work out like that. Mm -mm. Praise God. So wisdom, the ability to anticipate a consequence. And so, of course, when you're living right and you obe you're obeying the word, it creates a deep underlying confidence in God and you just keep breaking through because that's strong anointing. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And of course, then you begin to step into the blessings of obedience. Verse 11, for by me, your days will be multiplied and years of life will be added to you. Praise God. Well, now, Pastor Stephen, I'm just like old King Hezekiah. Long as God gives me 15 more years, I'll be happy. That's all I'm asking for. 15 more years. Well, why not just go to 100? You know, I mean, if you're 85, that's good. Praise God. But, uh, but you know, if you're 60, what are you doing asking for 15? Praise the Lord. Let the Lord take you on out there. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So that is that level of wisdom where you're walking now in the fear of the Lord, which carries you into the wisdom of God. You're able to discern between right and wrong, good and evil, a lie and the truth. Praise the Lord. And what is that? That's the knee level anointing. Who? Let's not stop there. Let's go further. Praise God. Mm -mm. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go back to Ezekiel. Chapter 47, Ezekiel 47, let's continue to read and see what comes up next. Verse 4, let me just go through that again. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters. The water came up to my knees. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the water and brought me through. The water came up to my waist. Well, praise God. So now we are at the waste level. And this is a place of progress where you've moved past the milk of the Word of God. That would be the ankle level. And even you are eating comfortably the meat of the Word of God. That would be the knee level anointing. But now you come to the honey level. And the honey level is the waste level. And the honey level is where you're walking in the revelation of the scriptures and the scriptures come alive so much that you can get honey or revelation on one scripture. And that one scripture unlocked can release you into new areas and realms of liberty and blessing and goodness, and it can come off a of one word from God, off of one scripture, literally. Praise God. So what is the honey? It is the unveiling of the hidden treasures of God's word. Mm -mm. And that's why some of you need to come on out further to get into the honey 
anointing. These insights, of course, bring you into power. And when you come into power, you realize, hey, the devil, he's not going to determine the outcome of my day or the outcome of my year and certainly not the outcome of my life. You realize that in Christ, you determine these things based upon the anointing that you choose to walk in and that you pursue and you go after the honey revelations of God. I think one of the greatest examples of this is found in the prayer of the Apostle Paul for of the Apostle Paul in the epistles. Uh, and I'm talking about the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, in the knowledge of Jesus, the knowledge of His Word, the knowledge of His ways, praise God, that the eyes of your understanding be flooded with light. It reminds me of Joshua in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, excuse me, not Joshua, but Saul's son. When he took that honey, his eyes illuminated, and he received energy and strength. Praise God. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Honey is an illuminator. The word alive and quickened unto you. It says in the book of Isaiah, concerning the Messiah, Christ, Mashiach, that he would know the difference between good and evil by his consumption of the curds and the honey. Mm -mm. There is the honey of the Word of God where you can just clearly look at something and say, that's wrong. Why? Because God identifies it in His Word as being evil and wicked, and thus you reject it, you stay away from it, and you also call it for what it is. Praise the Lord. So we need to be out in that waste level enjoying ourselves. But my friends, there's still room to go deeper. Deep calls unto deep is what the psalmist said. And we need to move on out into the river. Are you ready to go? Praise God. Let's, let's go back to Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel chapter 47. And we can go further now. Praise the Lord. Verse 5. Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross. In other words, you can't walk across the river because your feet won't be able to touch the bottom anymore. For the water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. In other words, he's saying you can't cross it by walking from one side to the other. It is so deep, you actually have to swim. How deep? It's really a limitless anointing. It's what Jesus was walking in, being filled with the Spirit beyond a measure. So he's not in a measure anymore. Well, Pastor Stephen, where in the world would that position you at? That would position you in what Jesus walked in, which was clearly defined in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 11. This is what you're coming into. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 11 verses 1 through 3, where you are walking in a place where the seven spirits of God are resting on you. And when they are all resting upon you, you have great latitude. You have great longitude. You can move. You can flow with anything. Look at this. The Spirit of the Lord, this is verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And all seven spirits were resting on Jesus, and they can rest on you too. And you could operate in the spirit of wisdom, and you can turn right around and operate in the spirit of counsel. And then when it's needed, you operate in the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And then you're also operating in understanding. Wow. What's taking place? You are, you are becoming very fluent, or we could use the word fluid. You can just flow with whatever flow God wants you to flow in. You can think, well, Pastor Steve and I, I have a career field and God has anointed me in that area. Yes, 
But when you get in the seven spirits of the Lord, you can minister in an, or, or you could operate, I would say, in the anointing in your career field. And that anointing will cause you to stand out. It will cause you to excel. But then you can turn right around and you can connect with school children. You could walk into a school children and you could explain what you do to them. And you could, you could talk to them and have fun with them and relate to them on a four or five year old level. Or you could lecture to your colleagues or you could teach others. I tell you what, the, there is a realm you could just go. And I've been thrown into all types of arenas, not just ministering to uh, what we would call preaching to the choir or ministering to believers. But I've been placed in realms where uh, I've spoken to all kinds of people. And the Holy Spirit, He will anoint me. I've spoken to drug dealers. I have spoken and ministered to, to gangsters. I have spoken to uh, political figures. I have spoken to those uh, in the acting world, in the inter entertainment industry, and it's a different anointing yeah, each time because they're, they're different people. And sometimes I'm prophesying, sometimes I'm ministering, sometimes I'm talking and just relating. I can, I can talk to kids, and it all depends upon who's before me. Because who is in front of me, it what determines the anointing that's going to flow out of me. I get real funny when I minister to kids. I can make kids laugh all day long. And I can make them giggle and laugh and roll on the floor in laughter. Why? That's what flows out of me when I get in front of them. Now, if I get in front of a different group, something different comes out. Okay? But what's going on? It's the ability to flow with the Holy Spirit. And there is a realm where you can flow anytime, anywhere, any place. Praise God. You know, I remember one time that uh, I was waiting uh, to meet with uh, Prophet Chuck Flynn. He was one of the key speakers at the uh, International Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International World Conference. And so, you know, you've got... Uh, you, you had people there like Reinhard Bonnke, and you had others, you know, uh, preeminent type of ministries in the earth that, that would be there. But he was one of the great prophets. And I had um, already called, and, you know, so we had a connection set up where he was going to minister to my wife and I. And so uh, what happened is that, as often was the case, I don't know if it's the case anymore, but the full gospel businessmen were known for running overtime all the time. And anytime Richard Shakarian would, uh, uh, you know, minister or, you know, or things like that, uh, the meetings, if the meeting started at seven, and it's supposed to be over at eight, well, it's going to be over at 10. <laughs> it's just like, he was like that all the time. And a lot of the guys, uh, uh, would just go with that flow. And then a lot of the old timers, they hated it. They were always wanting to run it by, run it by the book, run it right on the clock. And that, I like to run it on the clock too, especially when there's somebody else coming after you, you want to honor them and respect their time. Well, anyhow, uh, Chuck Flynn was supposed to be released out of this meeting at a certain time, but it ran over time. And so by the time, uh, I'm walking with him, Kelly and I are walking with him to his class we, everything was already now so late by the time he stalk, steps into his prophetic class to minister and prophesy, uh, you, you know, they're already been waiting for a long, long time. And I had to go to work in the evening. And so I'm walking with him to the class. And I said, um, I said, uh, you know, I said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to stay for your class. I've got to go to work here in just a few minutes. And I said, would it be possible for you to minister to us now? He said, sure. I said, do you need to pray or anything like that? Because he's just come out of a meeting sitting, you know, while somebody else was ministering. I said, you need to pray? He goes, oh, no. He said, I'm ready. He said, I'm always ready. I said, okay. See, all that was still new to me. I'm still learning these things. And uh, so Kelly and I had uh, so, uh, some notes uh, where we could write out what he's going to prophesy. And he just starts prophesying. And today, because the key things I wrote down uh, I've still got, I've still got them, but such a unique anointing to prophesy very, very accurately into very, um, core details of your life's calling and assignment. And he, he nailed it. It was phenomenal. I still remember it today and I have it written down also, but my friends, that anointing can be on you to flow anytime, anywhere in front of any audience, in front of any type of people. 
And that's why I'm not ever afraid to talk to anybody. It doesn't matter if it's a high-ranking politician or anybody or, a, 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 you know, a billionaire or anything like that. I, it doesn't move me one bit. I can talk to them just as easy as I can talk to a young kid in elementary class. <laughs> I, there, there's no difference in the anointing. It removes any area of inferiority. Praise God. But my friends, this is why you need to come on out and get into the things of the Holy Spirit and let that measure keep increasing, increasing until, until you're out in the real deep water. Praise the Lord. You know, um, in America, on the, on the Pacific side, the, the west coast of America, uh, you get in a boat and you go out about, uh, I can't remember, it's like 20 or 30 miles out. I've been out there before on deep sea fishing. And you hit an area where the continental shelf falls off. And suddenly, you go from water that's like a pretty blue, uh, like a, um, like a, what's that blue I'm, I'm trying to think of? More like a, um, a little bit of topaz uh, bluish color, and, but it's, it's not dark. It's a soft blue. And suddenly, when you hit the deep water and the continental shelf ends, and now the water's, you know, three, four, five miles deep, the water turns that dark dark blue. It's a beautiful blue. You're in the deep water now. <laughs> and it's the same way on the East Coast. There's a place you get out about 30 miles out and uh, it just gets real deep. Praise God real quick. Hallelujah. Water changes a different color. My friends, God wants you to come out into the deep. Thank you, Lord Jesus. By the way, on the East Coast, there's an area about, about 30 miles off uh, the coast of uh, North Carolina, where they have an annual fishing tournament where the blue marlin come. And it's a very special place because that's the, that's the fish that these pro fishers all want to catch. And by the way, there's a million dollar prize for the, uh, every year for the person that catches the biggest blue marlin. But these fish only come to a certain area to, to feed, and it's an area where the drop-off point is at. So within about a hundred yard spot, you've got all these boats, but within this area, about a hundred yards wide, and then it drops off to the real deep, that's where the marlin come and the big ones too from the deep water. So if you want to catch that, that's where you've got to go because they're not, they're not where the, you know, the waves are coming in. They don't go anywhere near that. They're way out there. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory, glory to God. Hallelujah, I hear the Holy Spirit just pulling. Deep calls unto deep, and you must walk in the anointing. It makes all the difference. Praise God. Glory, glory. And some of you are going to come into an anointing that's very much needed, where you have the answers. You have the answers. God is highlighting the church right now. The world is getting darker and darker. It doesn't understand certain things. There are those that are very sincere that honestly, they don't know which bathroom to use. They can't figure it out. They cannot look at themselves and figure out what they're supposed to do. It's a little bit like what God told Jonah concerning Nineveh. These people do not know their left hand from their right. And you, now you and I were like, okay, this is left and this is right. I know that's reversed on camera, but you know, you know, which, you know, these things there, there's, there are those that are out there that don't, that don't, but God is going to illuminate the church with such end time wisdom and such miracles and signs and wonders and such strong anointing that people will flock to the church because it is the place of safety. It is the place of answers it is the place of deliverance. It is the place of the wisdom of the most high God. Praise the Lord. Glory, glory to Jesus. And I see the seven spirits of the Lord contributing through you as you bring your anointing into the house of God. And that anointing begins to touch the lives of many people. Some of you will have business ideas and solutions. Well, you will have one product, particularly, excuse me, I think there's something uh, kind of bugging my eye, in my eye. I think it ju I just got it out. Hallelujah. But some of you are going to come into uh, an idea where you create one product. That one product is going to make you wealthy. That one product will bring happiness to many, many people, and they'll gladly pay for it. They'll line up to pay for it because it solves 
something that previously frustrated them, was a problem for them, and nobody else solved it, but you're going to. Hallelujah. And you don't need 10 million ideas. You just need one. You bring that one into fruition, bring it into maturity, and people stand back and they think, wow, why didn't I think of that? Because the anointing makes all the difference in you. Praise God. Praise God. My friends, come on out to the deep, swim around. And uh, what happens is you actually taste the power of the age to come. You're, you're actually, you're already touching areas in your life of what the millennium is going to be like. Glory, glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. I see the Lord lifting you up, setting you as a city upon a hill. Time for you to come out of any place of obscurity. It's time for you to shine. That is your destiny. Not to hide underneath a bed or underneath the bushel, to shine for the glory of God. Praise the Lord. Lift your hands. Father, I thank you for those that are watching today, that they are determined to increase the measure of anointing, and they are moving in that direction from this day forward. We thank you. I speak your blessing over their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. There are some of you that are watching today that you have not yet arrived on the shore. You can't get into the river until you at least stand on the bank of the water, the bank of the river. But in order to get on the, on the shoreline, you must be born again. If you do not know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are out of that anointing and you can't, you're not in it. You need to get into the true, pure anointing of God that will always bring glory and honor to Jesus. Hallelujah. If that's you, and I know there are those that are watching, today is your day of salvation. I want you to pray this prayer right now. Pray it out loud. You're going to pray to the Lord. Pray these words. Say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, but you died to save sinners, just like me. You died on the cross to save sinners like me. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, today, I ask you to save me, save my soul. Wash me with your blood. I give my life completely to you. Jesus, write my name in your book of life and step into my life. And from this day forward, lead me and guide me. My life now belongs to you. Jesus, thank you for saving me and washing me with your precious blood. Thank you that I'm clean. Jesus, I praise you. Amen. And amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. We, we rejoice. The angels in heaven are rejoicing because there are those who just gave their heart to Christ. Praise the Lord. Well, all of us together, we have the opportunity to take Holy Communion, and let's do that together. I want you to grab some some grape juice. That's what I have in my cup. Grab some unleavened bread and let's pray over it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bread and the juice. We bless it right now. We set it apart as being holy. And we thank you that this is now the flesh and the blood of Jesus. Father, as we receive the Lord's body, we thank you, O oh God, for the increase of the anointing of your Holy Spirit upon our lives to the degree that we can say like David did in Psalm 92, I have been anointed with fresh oil. Oh God, we give you praise for the increase. Lord, let us swim on out. Let us swim on out. Even as the words of Jesus echo in our ears where he told Peter, launch out into the deep for a catch. And I thank you, Father God, for great catches, multi-million dollar ideas, billion, multi-billion dollar ideas. We thank you, Father God. Oh God, I thank you that those that are watching today will make their mark. They will make their contribution to the church and to the earth. Oh God, we give you praise. We thank you, Father God. We now receive the flesh of Jesus. Amen. Let's partake. Praise the Lord. 
Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. Father, we thank you that if Jesus had a business, there's no way it could stay down. Father, he had a ministry. There was no way his ministry could stay down. So I thank you, Father, for every businessman and businesswoman that their business must rise. For those in career fields, they must go up. There's no way they could stay down. We thank you, Father, that as we receive the blood of Jesus, we thank you that we go up. We thank you that what's not in Jesus can't be in us. Failure was not in him. It cannot be in us. It cannot be in our ministries. It cannot be in our businesses. We thank you, Father God, for the anointing coming afresh upon our lives. We thank you, Father God, we're moving out into the deeper water. Thank you, Father, we receive the cleansing blood of Jesus and his mighty power. We thank you that you are bringing us into maturity through the anointing. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's receive the blood of Christ. Hallelujah. The anointing's working in your body. Disease must bow. Sickness must loose you and go now. Hallelujah. God's power is working in your body, healing you, transforming you right now. Walk in the anointing. Glory, glory to God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit coming stronger and stronger upon us. We thank you, O oh God, that we walk in freedom and we go about helping others get free through the power, setting them free and, de and bringing deliverance through the power of the anointing. Father, we give you praise. We thank you. We thank you that you're going to put certain people in our lives that will cross our path that need the touch of deliverance. We thank you, Father, that the anointing will flow. Others will need the prophetic word. We thank you that the anointing will flow. Others would need prayer for healing. We thank you the anointing will flow. Father, we thank you that these signs follow them that believe. So signs and wonders follow us. We are believers. Father, we give you praise. Let your anointing travel throughout the earth, strengthening your people, building up the body of Christ. Father, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Go and increase the measure of the anointing that God has given to you. I'll see you in the deeper waters. Bye-bye.